All right, we will go ahead and get started. Once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us on this webinar today. Um, we were very excited to be presenting this topic and sponsoring this presentation by Dr. Carlos Grandella. Um, to give you a little bit of insight on who our presenter will be today, Dr. Carlos Grandella is a vision rehabilitation optometrist at Viewfinder Low Vision Resources located in Arizona. Um, in this live presentation, he will be providing an inside look into patient care for low vision patients at any age, as well as the current tech based approaches for rehabilitation and more. This presentation is specifically for eye care providers, therefore we thank you all for joining us today. Um, Dr. Grandella will be giving a comprehensive and in-depth overview of some of the technology on the market, as well as a look into what a low vision rehabilitation optometrist does um, with patients as far as exams and so on and so forth. So once again, we thank Dr. Grandella for being here. The recording of this presentation will be available afterwards. We will send out an email to everybody. And again, we urge you to stick around for the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions that come up during this presentation, feel free to utilize the Q&A or the chat box throughout the presentation and we will answer them at the end with Dr. Grandella. Thanks again and I will begin the presentation now. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today uh, on a clinician's perspective on low vision rehabilitation. My name is Carlos Grandella. I am a low vision optometrist here in uh, Mesa, Arizona. I also go uh, across the state really. I'm as part of Viewfinder Low Vision Resource Center. Um, so I'm happy to present to you today, tell you a little bit about uh, low vision and what we do here. Our objectives are really to better understand uh, what is low vision and legal blindness and what causes it, um, how a low vision eye exam is going to differ from typical eye exams, um, how to better discriminate between the different kinds of aids that are out there so that if you're giving referrals for low vision, you're better able to um, share those things and, and tell them exactly what they want to go look for. Um, and to talk about specific adaptations patients could do at home where they don't really need a particular aid, but just lifestyle changes that they could need. Um, some financial disclosures. I, I'm a low vision optometrist. I work with these products. I'm a little biased to how well they work um, and to their you know, efficacy in the lives of people. Um, and I do this all day long every day. So I'm prone to thinking that this is a system that works. Other than that, no disclosures. Viewfinder Low Vision Resource Center, um, where I work, was established by Dr. Lynn Noon um, just under 30 years ago. And our mission is to improve the quality of life for those who are visually impaired through awareness, resources, and solutions. So we try to offer quite a bit to our patients to help them um, in understanding what they can do to change their lives. And these people come from a whole variety of conditions and disorders, um, whether it's neuro or whether it's trauma or whether it's something they're born with, um, genetic components and you know things that they may have done to themselves. Um, a lot of different reasons why you could have low vision. So who am I? Why do I get to talk to you? Well, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Virginia Beach, Virginia. So I'm wearing the red shirt up there in the top left hand corner. I grew up out there on the East Coast, and then I went across the country to Provo, Utah to go to Brigham Young University, so beautiful picture from uh, the White Mountain there in Provo. Then I crossed the country again to go to Memphis, Tennessee at the Southern College of Optometry, and uh, coming out of optometry school, I realized how little I knew about low vision and really wanted to pursue that. So we moved again to Chicago, Illinois. Um, by that time, I had two kids, and so it was a uh, our little family in a little uh, Chicago apartment there learning about low vision and ocular disease at the Chicago Lighthouse and Illinois College of Optometry. There I met the second love of my life, Deep Dish Pizza. Uh, we also love to go hiking as a family. Uh, and now we're in Arizona to actually pursue the career of low vision. Um, we have now a third child. Um, we love to go have prickly pear ice cream back here in Arizona. And, and I've really found a deep love here with the patients that I see of low vision and this um, modality uh, of work of really diving deep into their lives for how can I help them be independent, 
how can we give them tools and access to resources to really be the person that they want to be. So what is low vision? Well, it's any chronic uncorrectable visual impairment. Um, it's going to affect daily activities. So when we say uncorrectable, we mean glasses, contact, surgery, medication are not getting them back to a full range of vision, to a full use of vision. Um, that may not necessarily be 2020 that we're talking about. Um, you can have 2020 vision still be visually impaired. At least see common symptoms include blur, but include a variety of other things like visual field loss, glare, double vision, distortion, contrast sensitivity loss. Um, each of these can have an uh, you know, astounding effect on what you're able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we said before, there, there's a, a myriad of diseases that cause low vision. Um, I folded in the top hand left here under our acquired ocular diseases. The three that I see most often are macular degeneration, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. Um, you know, by far, these are, are the most common that I see. Um, but that's not to say I haven't seen these other conditions. Many of these, you know, we say that those are pretty rare. They're the zebras rather than the horses. But like we also say, it's not rare if it's in your chair. And I have seen multiple patients with every one of these conditions, even in my short time as an optometrist. Um, when you dedicate yourself to low vision, uh, they like to say low vision is optometry on steroids because we see a lot of these complex diseases. And so inherited conditions are very common as well. Retinitis pigmentosa, Stargardt's, albinism of one degree or another. These are very common reasons why we see low vision patients as well. Um, but again, um, they come from any block of life and for any reason. So vision impairment categories. How do we classify the vision impairment that's walking in our door and better communicate that to other doctors? Um, well, so looking at the standards set by the AOA and the World Health Organization, you're considered to have a normal vision if you're better than 20-30. You're considered to have a mild vision impairment um, up to 2070, so not including 2070. And this is our category zero, so no ICD code associated with this. Once you hit 2070 and up to 2200, that's where you're considered a moderate uh, visual impairment. Uh, beyond that is where we have legal blindness. So um, beyond 2200 up to 2400 is severe vision impairment. Beyond 2400 and up to 2200 is profound vision impairment. And once you get beyond 2,200, which would be a fine bloom of five feet, uh, 300 letters at five feet is another uh, measurement they give for this. Um, that's uh, where we're at a near total uh, loss. So that's up to light perception. So worse than 2,200 and up to light perception. Um, if we've lost that light perception, that's when it's considered a total blindness. So there are ICD codes associated with each one of these. Easy, easy thing to Google. Um, and if you have patients where, you know, obviously you're taking acuity with them, you're sending them out for low vision, easy to slap that code on and say, this is why we're referring them out. And as a low vision doctor sends reports to you, you should expect to see um, these categories given. It's something that can be used for OTs, um, something that we can easily disseminate this information to many different care providers. Well, how does that differ from legal blindness? You said legal blindness could start uh, within our moderate and severe categories. Well, most people are used to 2200 or worse is when we say you're legally blind. That's actually not the standard anymore because we have these newer, fancier charts that go in between 2100 and 2200. We had to update this and say it's actually anyone who cannot get a letter on the 2100 row. So if you're doing worse than, than 2100, you're legally blind. If you get a letter on there, then you're not legally blind. Um, the other way that we could classify this for people with RP or glaucoma is if you have 20 degrees of visual field or less. You may be 20, 20 down the center, but lose that peripheral field, 20 degrees or less, um, is considered legally blind. Now, legal blindness is just the, the line in the sand that the government draws to say this is when you get benefits and tax breaks and these other features, and that can vary state by state. But it is not 
us as doctors saying you cannot drive or you cannot work or you cannot be independent. There are ways to do this with the appropriate tools. So a couple of great graphics to look at for um, normal vision versus legal blindness. When you look at the city skyline here, our normal vision, you get lots and lots of detail. But even someone who's legally blind can still see, see the sailboat out there, can still see the buildings, especially the ones that are taller and make them out one from the other. They can see the clouds, they can see a lot of the colors that are coming through. So it can still be very functional vision. As well as somebody who has lost that peripheral field but maintains the detail inside of it. They can have great vision in that center vision, but you can imagine there's a lot more scanning that they would have to do to get back and forth and catch that whole picture that someone who's normally sighted might get instantly. So where do we draw the line as doctors to say, um, these are the people who need low vision, these are people who need vision rehabilitation. But what if they do fall into those mild or you know, no vision impairment categories? What if they have a scotoma that's not in the center, but off to the side, um, or perhaps not that dense? What if they haven't been here the long later, or their driver's license is still valid, or they've made adaptations, whether it's reading, or a worker school, um, or with their family members, or they've made adaptations already, and they feel fully functional? When do we send them off, and when do we keep them you know, in our primary care or ocular disease office? This is really what I'd like to answer with you today, what I'd like to tackle as we go through the next slides. So let's simulate a little bit of low vision here. Most of the people watching this, I imagine, will, will understand the concepts behind here right away. Um, so top left-hand corner, we have a picture of the uh, botanical gardens here in Arizona taken by Dr. Canis, um, who worked here at Viewfinder. And so we see some cactus and some plants and things like that out there. Um, in our other pictures, we have scotomas and visual field loss and hemianopic losses. So our top middle one, um, multiple scotomas, could be indicative of diabetes, for example. And, uh, several other conditions could cause these um, incongruent and um, different shaped scotomas all throughout the vision. They can be dark, they can be light, they can vary quite a bit. Uh, visual field loss in the top right hand corner, the peripheral loss, um, indicative of something like glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa. In our bottom left, our hemianopic loss, of course, is uh, very common in stroke, um, where we would expect this presentation to be linked to stroke. In our bottom right hand corner, that central scotoma, um, denser in the middle, more relative on the outside of it, is what we expect in macular degeneration or Stargardt disease or other macular conditions. Um, patients who come in with this could still have really good acuity outside of those areas of vision loss, but this is gonna affect them in tremendous ways, whether it's driving or reading or just watching TV or a million other things that they might be trying to do. So what am I gonna do a little bit differently than other doctors that might see these patients? Well, I explore very deep case histories I really want to use that case history to illuminate what's the patient's desire, what is their need, and I want to adapt my exam to feed that need. That's why they're coming to me as opposed to any other doctor. Um, we're going to refract and refract with trial frames to get our optical foundation. Um, glasses may or may not be the solution that they need, but it's definitely the foundation that we're going to build on with other devices. And these devices, these products, and things we recommend are going to be uh, personal solutions tailored to the goals and desires we've eliminated before. We're going to counsel with the patients on um, you know, the prognosis we expect, the outcomes we expect, different options and opportunities they can use. And we're going to help them set up a network between state programs and nonprofits, social groups, and all these community resources. And we're going to train them. If they pick up these complex devices or pick up products that need, you know, a little bit of extra run through and really help them know how to use that in the very best way. It's hard to pick up a whole new way of doing something um, just on day one. So how's a low vision exam different? This is me in my office in Sun City. Um, well, let's take a look at case history and visual goals, activities of daily living. 
So one of the big things we do in Low Vision is survey questions. You need to dive deep into what daily life is like. So the evidence of this, you know, if we talk about driving, we would ask, you know, are you a current driver? When was the last time that you drove? A lot of people will say, oh yeah, I haven't driven in years. And they're thinking in their mind, driven regularly. So it's a good question to ask them. When was the last time you were behind the wheel? Many people will tell you whether or not they're driving daytime or not nighttime, if they self-limit like that. We want to probe for these kinds of uh, information to see how much is glare affecting things or poor contrast. And they have difficulty with road signs or traffic lights, important information as drivers. Trouble seeing pedestrians, I didn't put that up, but that's always what I ask. Um, difficulty uh, driving locally versus driving long distance, driving in low traffic versus high traffic, on the highway, merging, lots of different things we can ask like that. Have they had any accidents in the last year or since the last time um, they were actively in driving? Um, beyond that, let's talk about ambulating. You know, can you walk independently? You need to rely on somebody else's arm. If you're on curves and stairs, can you manage those okay? Or do you always take the elevator? Do you trip and fall if things are placed in your way? Are you able to walk well only in a familiar location? What happens if you go to a grocery store you've never been before? Do you run into everything there? This is going to illuminate for us a lot of the goals and needs you want to work on. Again, everything is goal oriented and the goals are towards independence and a return to these activities of daily living. Whether we're looking for orientation mobility with a guide cane or a guide dog or electronic devices like the iris vision um, or an optical device for driving like a biopic. It's a personal goal that we're looking for and it could be work related, house related, school related, hobby related, you name it. Um, you know, every person who comes in is a different flavor of patient and a different flavor of world vision. So it really takes exploring this with them, taking that time in the exam, which not every other doctor can afford to do in the mode and the schedule that they need. Our other major goal is reading. And here's a great spot to ask a lot of questions. What kind of reading are we doing? Are we spot reading labels and barcodes because we work in packaging? Are we talking about extended reading? Is it electronic on a computer? Is it paper like sitting to read the newspaper every morning? Um, these will all make a lot of differences in the kinds of tools we provide and uh, the level of vision that they need. If it's large print, large barcodes, you don't need as detailed vision. Um, if it's regular print, we're seeing recipes and cooking instructions at home, we might need to give you a little bit more power. If you're trying to see uh, medications because your pharmacist that you need to read all these drug labels that are tiny and small, you need to give you something with a lot more power. So again, it varies by the patient. So we've talked about our case history. We've illuminated some goals that we want to tackle with these patients. And this is where we get into a functional exam. So looking here, this is a pretty common graphic you'll see with low vision uh, lectures, things like that, normal vision and then a scotoma placed over top of it. In our functional exam, we can't get rid of these scotomas. We can't give them a new retina, but we can make letters much bigger and we can teach them to look outside of that scotoma and help them adapt to new ways of doing things, different function to get back to independence. So very important to do a functional exam is to make sure that we put to bed the medical concerns. Um, so if someone uh, has a retinal specialist or glaucoma specialist, which is the majority of my patients, um, we want to make sure that they've been dilated within you know, a regular interval. Um, and if we can get a copy of their record, that really is going to make me feel good about uh, diagnoses that the patient can remember and treatments that the patient can remember. Um, actually seeing what the doctor has prescribed and done for them, expected return dates. Um, so we want to get medical records whenever we can. And if we see that that's all been taken care of, then we can tell the patient if they want to, we can defer dilation and still land exam and really focus on the goals that they're coming for. These daily activities, uh, working on working distances, devices, support networks. Um, a big part of functional optometry is specialty referrals. So if somebody walks into my office with no retinal specialist or no ocular care doctor. Um, that's when, you know, I, of course, I'm going to dilate them and take a look at that. 
but I will often refer them to continue that care with a specialist that's appropriate uh, because I don't have an OCP and uh, I'm not doing these skills on a regular basis. It'd be better for them to go someone who does that all day long every day. And I'll focus on the functional side of things where that's my bread and butter. Um, but we have a lot of these state programs, mobility specialists, other groups that I'm also going to be referring to as part of that support network. So in a functional exam, um, our OU acuities are super important. We can't skip eyes individually, but we have to know how is their life regularly. You're not going to typically close one eye. Some conditions may do that, but we need to know what is regular life like for you. This really touches into um, the idea of acuity threshold versus a fluent acuity, or reading acuity. Um, so when you test somebody up near with an acuity chart, um, you want to see just what are the tiniest letters that they can read. Um, well, that's a great thing to do, but if they're struggling at normal size print, and we say, well, you saw normal size print, that's great. Um, we can't expect them to go and read a normal size print newspaper. They're going to struggle with that. That's their threshold. Um, we need to give them two or three lines of reserve. So if somebody's goal is to read a normal size print newspaper, I want their threshold to be down a small size print so that the normal print is easy for them. And then a special component of this is going to be their working distance. Um, where are they comfortable holding that newspaper? Um, if we can pull that in and get ex extra magnification, that could be a great thing. But if they're on a computer that has to sit a foot away from them because of X, Y, and Z, then working distance is going to be an important factor in what we recommend and how we prescribe. Uh, binocular function plays a lot of a role into this. You know, we always have to account for dyslopia and rule that out compared to binocular rivalry caused by someone who would say one eye is a wet macular eye and the other is dry and we have a big discrepancy in the vision that can cause rivalry. And to explain that to a patient, help them understand how to get around those issues and symptoms. Uh, we have to talk about eccentric viewing with patients, some who are doing it already, some who need to be taught and trained how to do it. Contrast, super important, glare control, you know, hands-free, that's similar to working distance. This is something that's going to change the products and modalities we talk about right now. So uh, jumping to contrast and acuities, let's talk about you know how our charts are different and how we might write them down differently. All right, so low vision acuities. Um, as we test visual acuity and low vision, we're going to do this a little bit different than standard doctor offices. Um, when we look out at 20 feet with a patient, even if we give them a 400 letter or 600 letter or 1,000 size letter, they might not be able to see it out at 20 feet due to their scotomas or, or other things that are going on. Or it may simply be that they need a bigger uh, size character in order to see it. So there are many charts we can use for this. I use Fine Bloom a lot. You can use EBTRS or Bailey Love as well. Um, but if I bring my Fine Bloom chart into five feet, so that the patient can see my 700 size number on the fine bloom, I would write that down as 5 over 700, and often convert that when I uh, give her a report out to other doctors to 20, 2800. Um, so that's not a typical size you're going to get on your electronic screen or projectors, um, but that's the level of vision this patient would actually have. When we do near acuities, this is where we'll shy away from our, you know, our standard five feet or 20 feet, and we convert entirely to metrics. Um, so we'll do our metric notation distance over a log monitor score. So if the patient reads habitually at 20 centimeters, then we're going to want to put 20 centimeters down uh, for what they're reading. If they can read uh, the 20-20 line out at 40 centimeters, and that's where we typically test is out at 40 centimeters. Then we're going to put 0.4 M for 40 centimeters and then 0.4 large M for the logmar score. So that's a 2020 line at 40 centimeters or four point print at 40 centimeters. Again, if they're habitually reading at 20 centimeters, we'll do a 0.2 M instead. It's not important to me what distance, that's a lifestyle issue and sometimes a magnification issue. Um, for our pediatric and nonverbal patients, this is where we really want to lean into our forced choice tests, our contrast grades, things like color beauty cards, card of cards, 
we are matching, we are grading, um, these things that may be a little bit more objective, not quite as subjective for those who are nonverbal, maybe because of a stroke or a developmental disability, or those who are pediatric and just too young or too cognitively impaired to be able to express that to us. So contrast acuity. This is our third kind of acuity, not distance, not near, but contrast. This is essential to understanding how does this patient function outside of the exam room. So Kelly Robson charts and Mars charts, and there are also contrast gradings that we can do. This is going to tell us if we keep the letter the same size, but fade out the contrast, at what point can they no longer distinguish between the gray and the white background? This is important for newspapers. It can be very important for food as well, changing the background compared to the food item that we eat. So moving beyond our acuities, once we've taken acuity and we do our entrance chair skill, which will be the same, we want to get into refraction. And in low vision, you have to, have to, have to do refraction with a trial frame. Even though it's sexy and fast to do it, like Justin Timberlake and a Ferrocter, um, we got to use a trial frame for those who are eccentrically viewing, for those who have binocular rivalry or diplopia. Um, for those who may have very strong prescriptions, very delicate prescriptions, we want to make this as real life as possible for the patient. Um, so putting a trial frame on is going to be as close as possible to getting them in the exact prescription they'll be wearing once they purchase that pair of glasses. So when we give somebody glasses, you got to make sure that we have full-time wear for protection. For anybody who's low vision and is um, potentially a hazard to themselves for mobility, for anybody with visual field loss, for anybody who's monocular, for anybody with one eye significantly better than the other one. Um, this is something, you know, injuries are, are easily preventable. So we always recommend polycarbonate or Trivex impact resistant lenses. Um, and this can be prescription or Plano or fit over sunglasses or however you want to, you know, bake the cookie. Um, we've got to have some protection. Once we've done our refraction, that's when we move again. This is our optical foundation. So we're moving into our rehab. Um, so if a patient cannot achieve their goals just through glasses, we start talking about all the different things we can do for their goal to help them achieve it. So we've got eight different things, major steps we want to do to rehabilitate uh, low vision. Magnification, a lot of contrast options, field expansion for those who need it, additional training, site substitution in some cases, and building that community support method. When we magnify, three major ways to do it. Some of these are patient may be doing already, and these are easy tips to give them. Uh, change the size of what you're looking at. And if you have a hard time reading small size print, get a large print book, and that could solve this, the issue for you. Um, well, if you can't see your TV, Try distance magnification, move closer to the TV. Um, just as you see a car approaching in the distance, gets closer and closer and bigger and bigger. If you move closer to your TV, you have a larger retinal image. Um, so that, again, may solve this, the issue at hand. Um, but beyond that, where we really shine is angular magnification, where we talk about our optical and electronic products. Um, whether it's magnifiers for up close or telescopes for distance. So optical devices, when we're putting a lens in front of something, these tend to be cheaper options, not always, um, but this is what a lot of people will get at the drugstore. They'll get an over-the-counter magnifier, whether or not it's the right power for them. Um, stand magnifiers, where you don't pick it up off the table. Microscope glasses, where it's a very high-powered lens with the material held very close. Um, telescopes for distance, like the gentleman in the top left, you would use that for driving. Um, and that's an embedded telescope or a bioptic. And microtelescopes, like a dentist or a doctor might use, where it's poor up here, but it is a telescope system. So lots of different solutions here. Then we get into video magnifiers. And I think video magnifiers are, are by and large, always superior to our optical devices. Opticals will be more economic, generally. Um, opticals you have to use for driving, but when you're um, talking about portable devices or even desk-bound devices, you get a lot more zoom out of the electronics, um, and you have options for contrast. 
So in the top right hand corner, we can see uh, Freedom Scientific's Ruby um, is showing us a reverse contrast. It's pointed at a black and white pamphlet in the background, but the text that we're seeing there is white on black. It's very comfortable, very easy for a lot of patients to see. Um, you also may look at desktop devices. So these are larger, larger devices, but not portable. Um, bigger screen, which allows them for a bigger and better magnification, but you can't take it with you. Wearable devices like Iris Vision really shine in getting kind of all of these features pulled into one thing together. So our wearables, there's, there's several different brands of this, but I'm here with Iris Vision and talking about Iris Vision because I honestly think it's the best. So eSight, New Lines, Patriot, and Adaptive may be names that you've heard. Um, and I've tried each of these devices and met with each of these companies, but I find that by and large, if you want to get great distance and near acuity out of one device, if you want the greatest field of vision and something that's portable, something that will have contrast enhancement options like that negative background, white letters on a black background, connection to the internet, um, optical character recognition reading software and voice assistance. I think Iris Vision out of all these companies is the only one to pack them all in and they do the best job. So which solution out of all of these, optical or video, wearable or desk mount, um, is the right one for this patient? Well, it depends all on uh, their lifestyle, their personal preference, the particular goal. Uh, for example, if somebody wants to sew and do needlepoint, then you can't give them a handheld magnifier because they need two hands to do their hobby. That's when we're really going to talk about microscope glasses and bringing things in closer or a desk bound magnifier and looking at the screen instead of looking at the material itself. Uh, economy will play a big role in this. What can they actually afford? And what do they like to use? This is where I, I kind of draw a line between prescribing and recommending. I'll prescribe all of these products or recommend all of these products jointly and talk to the patient about the advantages and disadvantages. And it's really on the patient's shoulders to decide what do they want to move forward with. They're the ones who have to have the motivation to do the practice and use these devices as well. They're the ones who are paying the money to have this. And when you buy a desktop magnifier for $3,000, you have to have that gumption come in front of yourself and not a doctor imposed mandate on what you have to do. So I truly try to give them all the information and resources and make that recommendation as opposed to a prescription. This is what you get and this is what you have to do and help that patient adapt their life to the choice they think is right for them. So beyond magnification, we get into illumination. The next couple steps, we're talking all about contrast. Contrast is absolutely essential. Um, even once you magnify, you have to have great contrast. You may use this in the kitchen while you're cutting things or cooking. You may use it on the desk with an adjustable lamp. You may use it for mobility to tell where's the horizontal and vertical aspects of your staircase. That's a great way to use illumination. We'll talk about decreasing glare. So this top left picture, you can see uh, myself wearing sunglasses, my wife squinting because she took hers off, and our little baby girl who didn't get a pair and she's hating life for it. Um, sunlight is a common source of glare, talking to any low vision patient, but you also may get it on fluorescent lights, digital screens, headlights, you name it, keep going. You want to beat that with tinted lenses of varying colors depending on the source of that light. And a reflective coating, proper task lighting, making sure that we have it set up in an appropriate way, and brim hats are another great thing that we can recommend to patients. For some, especially achromatopsia patients, we may be recommending contact lenses so that we can have full-time wear of our glare control product. Now, Aniridia is another great example of this, where they're going to get glare for that lack of iris, and whether it's partial or total or coloboma or an injury, and they may use something like a prosthetic or a blackout lens to cut that glare all day, every day. Contact lenses are also great for cosmesis. Um, you can see in the bottom right picture, we do have an eye color difference, but if she puts both contact lenses in and both eyes are brown, then nobody's going to know the difference if they need her for the first time. 
Enhancing contrast incorporates both cutting glare and increasing illumination and changing color schemes with things. Um, so our medication example here, dead center, is a great example. A lot of people talk about losing pills, that they drop it and it just disappears forever. But putting a colored background behind that can help us identify, even though it's small and our acuity lacks in that regard, we may be able to pick it up by the color difference. Changing colors on appliances, changing colors on stairs, um, how we paint the house and do our carpeting. These are uh, maybe not little things, but um, mundane things that we can do at home to really enhance our function and ability to do our vision. Field expansion. This is a great topic and one we could take an entire lecture on. Not every patient is going to need this. This is for people with glaucoma, stroke, retinitis pigmentosa, and several other conditions. The top right graphic from Chadwick shows somebody uh, losing vision off the left hand side. So a typical left hemianopsia. Um, so in this image, great right eye field of vision, losing everything to the left. Well, how do you get around that? There's a couple different things we could do. Um, you could try yoked prisms to move that left field into the vision. Typically not as good for stroke, maybe better for a few other conditions. Um, teleprism is one of the best ones for stroke. So that bottom right picture, you can see stickers placed above and below the midline view. We don't want to lose that midline field of vision, but above and below it, we're pulling in that lost left side. So for example, if someone was walking through, uh, let's say a crowded street in New York, they could get the bottom and top half of everything passing on the left-hand side. So if there's a biker who's coming quick, they might catch the image of the wheel below and the bike coming above and understand that something's going on to the left. I need to turn with that good central field, pick up that whole scenario. We want to do this for mobility to allow people to walk independently without having to have anybody else holding their hand. Uh, reverse telescopes, assistive technology, these are great options as well. Um, with many, many devices, we're going to need to take extra time to train. So I'll often have patients um, come in on their dispense visit to take a half an hour with me at least to sit down and run through basic options. And if there are advanced settings, to come back and do that again on another day. Site substitution, this is the category for those who perhaps magnification is just not good enough. Or they can see it, but they can't do it in an efficient and functional way. So here's where we really reach out to our community resources. In, Ar in Arizona, we have our uh, state talking book library. There are national programs for this as well. This is a free service of talking books for anybody with um, a vision impairment, has trouble reading, or legal blindness to get books on tape instead. A similar program is the Sun Sounds of Arizona. They read major publications over a private radio channel. They actually mail you a radio that's set to their frequency. You won't pick it up just on your standard radios. Um, but many patients will use common companies like Audible from Amazon or Seeing AI, which is a smartphone app they can use. Again, there's products like Orcam or Iris Vision that have OCR capabilities. And there's also features that may already be available to you, like um, audio descriptive services in theaters or on DVD menus. Um, for our younger patients, we often recommend learning Braille and these other sight substitution techniques. Uh, instead of ears for eyes, which is what we do with you know, our audio tools, we may also use touch instead. And that's for an orientation team to come in. Uh, this picture has a gentleman uh, being trained on use of his orientation cane. You may pair that with field enhancement tools like a teleprism, or pair that with audio tools like Google Maps telling you when to turn. But the long cane is a touch-based substitution to help us identify changes in elevation or places that we might trip. We can upgrade that to a guide dog, or in certain cases, you might use a human-sighted guide. Definitely, we'll need training on how to take this other sense and replace um, your visual aspect of navigation with this sense. All right, um, assistive tech OCR, again, lots of apps, lots of products that will do this. Absolutely um, important thing for those who find that visually the magnification 
cannot get them uh, achieving the goal the way that they would like to. Or a great tool to use if your eyes are, eyes are tired at the end of the day and magnification is just kind of fatiguing you and wearing you out. You might say that once you get home from work, you don't want to use the magnifier anymore and you just want to listen to them. Again, community resources. We've touched on this a little bit. Here are graphics from you know, national and state groups in Arizona. Um, it's really important to reach out and find who are the groups in your vicinity that you can refer patients to, to get mobility training or to get access to these devices or to hear audio tools or maybe advocacy like the Arizona Center for Disability Law. So he's having trouble in a work program, not getting the ADA things that they need. We need to connect them with groups that can vouch for them and fight for them. So our last step of how do we make this low vision exam different? Once we've figured out their level of function, given them glasses, and looked at tools that can help rehabilitate them, again, we're referring to those important partners that can pick up um, the other end of the stick and help walk the patient forward um, and provide resources and intel that maybe we can't do in our time period. So our vision rehabilitation team is huge, from their PCP um, to their systemic specialties to their ocular disease specialist to the low vision doctor. There are a lot of doctors who are going to be involved with these patients. And I think everybody needs to get follow-up report, you know, um, within reason, you know, maybe cardiologist doesn't really feel like he wants that report, needs that report, but there are going to be ones who do. Neurology, hematology, who want that vision report. So it's on us to make sure we're communicating and closing that referral loop. Uh, PT and OT may be essential for device training or mobility training. Um, psychology and counseling, super important. But I think really, really big is family, friends, and those daily social networks we're part of. This list goes on and on and will differ between each patient, but we want to include as much of this network as we can in what we're doing here in the exam room and in the repeat training sessions that we have with these patients. So of course, um, like we said, closing that referral loop, and we wanna make sure we're sending reports back. Um, we don't wanna redo what these doctors are doing. We're not trying to give a second opinion or confirm their macular degeneration. Um, we want to support what these doctors have done and their specialty. When necessary, we do offer these opinions, but as a low vision doctor, um, I wanna specialize in what I'm doing and let the other people do what they do better than me. Uh, we want to reinforce, of course, the treatment plans and education we're giving, because as we all know, the patient may not pick it up well the first 12 times we explain something. Um, these are complex issues, and if you haven't gone to optometry school or the medical school, it may be difficult to really internalize what's going on in your glaucoma or your diabetes or etc. State programs, public agencies, and nonprofits, again, are a big part of what we do. And often cases for me, they're referring patients to me, and they're the ones reaching out to extend that network. And our job, again, is to find out the level of function that's available, and then the devices, products, and adaptations we need to do to function at school or at work or depending what the agency is referring them to. These agencies will approve or deny recommendations, oftentimes pay for the exam, pay for training, pay for low vision devices, and may have their own technology specialists, mobility specialists to accommodate what the patient needs to be independent and fully functional. So whether they're coming from an agency or we need to refer them out to an agency, it's important that we keep this network going and play our role in it. Supporting counseling is a huge part of this, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, losing vision is a personal loss and is affected by the stages of grief. So it's important to have you know, informational seminars to educate you, but also support groups for someone else to just be there with you, someone who walks in your shoes and understands the life that you live. Family and doctors and friends cannot always understand what a patient is going through. Um, it's also important to just have a professional counselor that you can go and talk to to express the depression, the anger, the anxiety, the grief that's come with that. Family and group counseling may be necessary as well to bring in those people who are trying to support us and educate them on what they're doing wrong, what they're doing right, and how to better work together to overcome these issues. 
lots of state and national groups, like I said, Foundation for Fighting Blindness, a great national program. The V-Rate, a uh, conference we hold here in Arizona, bringing uh, technology and adaptations and innovations to the low vision community. Great programs, and we want to include patients and um, you know, promote these things as much as we can to give them access to everything they need. So extensive, extensive education. I think I've highlighted that enough. Um, this may be overwhelming to try and do all of this in one exam. Sometimes we get to the end of the glasses and we have to say, you know what, let's come back and do magnifiers or electronics on another day. We want to give them stuff to take home to read over because again, you may tell it to them 12 times and you're just not going to get it. Um, it takes time to process and internalize these things. Sources online for them to look at, like um, our social groups that will, uh, like NOAA for those who have um, ocular albinism and hypo hypopigmentation. Great resources for them to look at and internalize and talk with others. Visual aids for them to take home or here in the office to understand the disease process. All of these, very important. Help the patient understand and make the best decisions. So here are these questions that we talked about before about when to refer somebody out. When do we draw the line and say they need vision rehab or low vision? Um, I would suggest that automatic referrals um, to low vision should include people with the best corrected vision of 25th year worse, significant visual field defects, those who are eccentrically viewing, those with binocular rivalry and dysphopia, uh, unresolvable glare, contrast sensitivity impairment, um, and anyone really who can tell you that their daily goals are being affected by vision, especially if you've worked refraction over and over with them, no matter what you do, they cannot get a satisfactory acuity. And those who you may be tempted to tell, we've done everything that we can for you medically, and the disease is just going to continue to progress. These are the patients who need to see a low vision specialist because there is more that we can do. We have lots of options to give them and the options are always growing. Um, even every quarter to six months, we have new products that are available and updates to existing products. The time for doctors to dive a little bit deeper is when uh, people you know, bring up that they have a hobby or reading or driving that's being affected in spite of the good acuity they may have with you in the office. Um, people who know they're bumping into things or falling, especially if you notice that in the office. Excessive wear of glare filters. So if they come into your exam with sunglasses and they have a lot of sensitivity and you're checking pupils and things like that. Um, diplopia that comes with ocular disease, retinal disease, glaucoma. Poor ability to fixate, uh, to concentrate, to maintain eye contact. These are all areas where we might start to probe and ask a few more questions. And patients who are very dependent on others to do basic and essential activities. Um, these are all people that I would say, it's time to ask a few more questions and consider recommending them over for vision rehab. We talked about a lot today. Um, if you have any questions, please um, let us know here in, in the live section or send us an email. Again, uh, I'm Dr. Grandella over at Viewfinder Low Vision Resource Center. I appreciate the time you guys have all taken with me here today. So thank you everybody for turning out today. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk with you about low vision. Um, I, you know, I, I enjoy this topic so much. Um, a couple questions that we, we had um, and a few closing remarks. Um, so I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to partner with Iris Vision. Um, they, they've really gone the extra yard for serving my patients beyond just, you know, um, the financial purchase and, and, you know, tutorials that they do for their products. They've also reached out to do that low vision support group with me and, and spreading knowledge and, and education for patients, I think is huge. Um, so I'm grateful to talk to other doctors about this as well and, um, you know, help you guys serve in the same way um, to your patients who might have these needs and, and it has gone unnoticed or, or somebody new who comes in and you find that this is applicable. Um, so one of the questions we got here was, uh, can doctors delegate the training of low vision devices to staff and bill for it? That's a great question. 
Um, so in low vision, we're billing on time. That's face-to-face -face time. Um, so the time that my staff takes for pre-testing, the time that they take afterwards for any additional device demos, or if a patient comes on another day, wants to repeat a demonstration of a device, none of that staff time is billable. Um, so that's one reason why a lot of the training I have my staff set up for doctor appointments with myself, um, and I can bill for OT training uh, for that time. It's not as good as an exam, um, but that's still billable time. So I try to make use of that. Um, high volume, low vision practices, places like the Chicago Lighthouse, for example, have their own OTs to do that training. And so it's still billable time for them because they have a certified professional doing it. Um, but let's say you get through your comprehensive exam and you notice we want to talk about some magnifiers too. If you hand that off to the staff, that's where you cut off the billable time. You can't bill um, for what the staff is doing. Um, so that's a great, great question. Thanks for submitting that. Thank you so much for answering that, Dr. Grandella. I also have some um, questions as well from other viewers. So one question is, which of the disease pathologies you see do you tend to monitor more closely to mitigate further vision loss? And at the same time, what are some of the challenges you experience to do that effectively? So those are great questions. Um, like I alluded to earlier, a lot of the ocular disease, I'm sending that out to a specialist for that to be seen. Um, but cases that I see progress most quickly are, are again my top three, macular degeneration, especially when it's wet, uh, diabetes and glaucoma. Um, I've had uh, patients with uh, macular degeneration that by the time they come to pick up their glasses, put the glasses on and say, well, this isn't nearly as good as it was the day I was here. And uh, I've had patients who in that time frame progressed from dry to wet or patients who were wet and further progressed by the time they came back. So um, I really try to emphasize with patients um, being in on time to seeing their, their disease specialist, whether that's an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, depending on the condition, um, you know, if they're getting injections and things like that, or if they need injections, you want to put that in the right hands, depending on which state you're in, that, that's going to change. Um, so if I have anybody who does have significant changes compared to last time I've seen them, I, I'm right on top of, okay, when was last time you saw your specialist? Did they notice any changes? When do you do to go back with them? Um, and if they have a hard time getting in to see that specialist again, I, I always tell them, I'm happy to do a dilation. I'm happy to take those checks. Um, but we don't want to, since we're a referral-based group, we don't want to take that um, service out of the hands of the care providers who are already doing it. Um, so I would say, again, those top three, the acquired conditions, are the ones I see progress the quickest. And if I'm catching progression, I'm typically putting that back in the hands of the doctors who are already managing that um, as fast as we can, really emphasizing that to the patients. Um, the second question there, how are we dealing um, with seeing patients right now. Um, I, I assume that might be alluding to COVID a little bit and, and you know, the troubles that we're having uh, with keeping patient flow and things like that. Um, we, we've actually done pretty well um, keeping a steady pace because we have longer patient hours. We don't see as many patients in the day. Our lobby doesn't get as full as some of the practices we're seeing 15, 20, 25 patients in a day or more. Um, so we're able to space people effectively that we haven't had to change our schedule, but we have just in October opened up our telehealth services and home visits. Um, so we have a few outlying areas um, that are a couple hours away, um, a little hard for patients to come out and hard for other doctors to host us if we're doing a satellite clinic. Um, so I'm taking time to drive out to patients. Um, there's a few log logistics and figuring out, you know, when and how to do that in a way that's providing the right amount of money for us. Um, but so I am doing home visits for exams, nursing home exams, things like that for those patients who are sick and unable to travel out to us. But we're also doing telehealth. And that's something I, I've actually talked with Iris Vision about recently. There, um, I, I believe we're in the beta stage of testing um, using the Iris Vision device as a telehealth source. Um, and so that's a great opportunity, again, for people who are unable to travel, are, are at risk for COVID, or just worried about being in a place where 
we do have people coming through. We do clean, but it's anybody's guess as to, you know, when somebody is asymptomatic and has COVID-19. So we, you know, we're already booking patients for these services. And I think it's um, something we're all very grateful for. Everybody's expressed a lot of uh, admiration and surprise and encouragement for doing these new modes of seeing patients for people who kind of slip through the cracks. Um, so those are great questions as well. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Grandella. Um, so just in, in that whole idea of um, remote patient care, I know we've had extensive conversations and different um, programs we've offered through Iris Vision. Um, can you talk a little bit about your patient's experience with Iris Vision and um, how that remote support technology has been useful for them, especially during this time? Absolutely. Um, well, so Iris Vision is my top device as far as wearable electronic magnifiers. Um, and that's because having tested them, you know, most of them all out, um, even the new eSight 4 and things like that. Um, and none of them pack all the same features that Iris Vision does into one unit. And, and I feel that none of them do it as well and as seamlessly as Iris Vision does. Um, it's, it's a little bit to get into, you know, at the very first meeting, if you have a patient who's 70 years old and not technolo technologically handy, you know, it, it takes a good 20 minutes to get in and explain the device the first time. Um, but once we get over that first hurdle, many people are very surprised at how well it focuses both far and close. The ability to zoom into like a bioptic mode where just one section is zoomed in allowing them to focus on the cards they're playing with, but still be able to see the whole room. Um, or the iris reader, where it will read the text out to them. You know, to pack all these different things and more into one device has been special. Um, but then we get to tell them, well, when you go home, you know, not only can I do training in the office with you, but Iris Vision has um, trainers who have vision impairment who use the device um, and they're available on the phone. Um, the first session, I think, is about 45 minutes. And the trainer will actually log into the device with the patient, be able to see everything that the patient is seeing, and walk them through um, setup changes, using different modes, and the practicality of being at your home with the book you're trying to read while you're using that device. It's hard to simulate that in the office. Um, so that's one of the huge advantages of using this as a telehealth source where doctors can also log into the device with patients um, the same way that these trainers are, be able to do a home evaluation in that sense um, and get to see something that we really don't see in the office. Um, and then also walk the patient through training and things like that. Um, Iris Vision has come out with visual acuity, contrast sensitivity and visual field testing which is superb for doing as a, as a telehealth mode. And it's all done through the Iris Vision device. And I think they have another beta device that goes with it. Um, so that will get shipped out to the patient. And then they have opportunities you know, to take those tests even at a distance, um, which I haven't heard from many other sources. Um, so on the one hand, you have Iris Vision as a product for them to use at home. And they have a telehealth way for trainers to log in with them and walk them through how to use it, you know, because you can't remember it all from the first appointment. But then also the doctors, we have a telehealth way to meet with these patients and do additional training and evaluation uh, in spite of everything going on with the pandemic. Definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Grandella. That was a great in-depth overview. Um, the questions, the responses, the presentation um, as a whole was very informative. And once again, we thank you so much for your time and efforts in participating in this presentation, everything you've done. Um, so I have put um, Iris Vision and Viewfinder Low Vision Resources contact information on the screen in front of you. Um, feel free to take note of the contact information or if you are viewing from your phone, feel free to uh, screenshot the screen so you have this contact information. If you have any specific questions regarding Iris Vision um, or Dr. Grandello's services, um, we are more than happy to answer those questions. Um, 
and redirect the conversation um, to give you more information. So thank you again, Dr. Grandella. It seems like those are all the questions that we have. Um, it was great having you on board today and um, we look forward to having more presentations in the future. Thank you everybody for turning out. Appreciate your time.